once you've carted into the microscope, you can proceed to get the logbook, which may be found on the PC directly behind you. And you'll see that the system is running Windows XP. There is a server window that may be available. And then on the desktop, you will see a smart SEM login just down here. You can double click on that. That will prompt you to sign in as your username. Your username will be the first part of your RPI email address. And then you can type that in. Once you have logged in as your user, you can proceed to fill in the logbook. The logbook will be filled in with the date. Your username, which is the first part of your RPI email address. What type of sample you'll be doing today. In training, typically we use standards, so I'll write down standards. We'll write down what type of mounting material you'll use, and I'll show you what those are in a few minutes. In this case, we're going to say that these samples have been mounted with silver paste. <clears throat> you'll get a warning on screen to remind you to start your logbook entry. And then you can fill in your vacuum level. Looking at the user interface, you will find that there's Windows pull-down menus across the top of the screen, a user customizable toolbar, docking panel on the right-hand side, the black area is where the image would normally be found, a dynamic data bar, a status bar, which tells you the vacuum levels, gun settings, and high voltage setting, if it's on or off, as well as a hard front panel status box, which could be positioned in the corner, and then a set of user toolbar, uh, user toolbar for annotation and measurement. annotation and measurement. We'll go to the find the SEM control panel, find the vacuum tab. If that is not readily available, if you come underneath vacuum, you could select vacuum status and it would automatically open that panel. At this point we log that into our logbook. And then we can proceed to write down what settings we might be using today. You can wait till the end of your session to fill these in. The settings would be EHT, that's your extra high tension setting. Your aperture size, that's your primary current control. We'll talk more about that when we actually go to run the microscope. And then what detector you might be utilizing. This is the area where you would normally do your sample preparation. All of the sample holders that are available will typically be found in this area. All of the sample holders have a dovetail on the bottom, which is identical. When the dovetail is inserted onto the SEM stage, it always goes flat side first. Looking at the top of most of the holders, on the opposite side there is a small hole for inserting an exchange rod if there is a sample exchange chamber installed. And then that is there. With any of the sample holders that utilize the 1.5 millimeter Allen tool, it is suggested not to turn the screws out too, too far, otherwise they fall out onto the floor. And then there won't be any sample um, set screws available. Clean and dirty stubs are found here. A stub can be inserted into the holder. 
tightened into place and then a sample could be placed upon that stub. The samples can be held on with double-sided carbon tape, double-sided copper tape, or alternatively, silver paste. The silver paste is probably the most conductive and easiest to remove your samples from the holders. The only problem with this material is that it will leave particles of silver behind. So if you have any other needs for your samples after the fact, this may not be the best choice. The best choice for <clears throat> low residue would be the double stick copper tape. The only problem here is that the adhesive is not absolutely the most conductive thing in the world. Carbon tape is probably the next most conductive behind the silver paste. The only problem is this stuff is very, very sticky and after it's been in the vacuum for a while, it is very, very difficult to get your samples off of this material. I have a set of samples that I've already prepared for this. We have a few standards here. Uh, a Chessy grid standard, which is utilized for doing um, calibrations. It's also very easy to focus and stigmate on since it is silicon and gold. We have a gold resolution standard and then we have another sample that will test how well you can focus through a range of depths of field. Okay, so we'll go Back from there. the microscope. We can come in to the uh, hard control panel interface and there is an exchange button located right here. This exchange button will actuate the exchange procedure for loading your sample. In pressing that button, you'll receive a message on the display which suggests, do you want to vent the chamber, yes or no? The ability to say no would be if you accidentally hit that button. It'll turn on the infrared chamber scope, move the stage to a safe position, and then stop the pumps. The procedure that is done within this is detailed within the user training guide and the reason that it is broken down into the individual steps is that if should the exchange button not work, you can figure out how to do it. And again, remember that when you take the sample holder, you have a flat side and a round side. The flat side goes on first. There is no indicator as to when the vacuum will actually be ready for venting. Typically the vent procedure takes about three to four minutes and then the pump down procedure takes about an equal amount of time. The infrared chamber scope will come on while you are preparing to get your samples in. That's part of the procedure that is outlined in how that works. We will now take our sample holder, which you can see here, and we'll bring it over to the microscope. Gently pull on the door and then you can come in and take your sample holder. Remember that the flat side goes on first. So you would pick it up, bring it over, bring it down. You'll see that there's a small ramp here and then two little pieces that will mate against the flat side of the holder. You will gently slide that into place. As you note, there's a little um, notch in the bottom of the holder. That notch will fit onto this round piece here. You can very gently slide that into place until it hooks. This is the y-axis this is the x-axis. There's 130 millimeters of travel in x and y. The z can move up and down by 50 millimeters. This stage can tilt up to 70 degrees in this plane and about five degrees in this plane. Looking inside of the chamber, you can see the bottom of the final lens is here. The front of the x-ray analysis detector is here, EDS, energy dispersive spectroscopy. Behind that is the secondary electron detector, 
of the Everhart Thornley type. That's the small cage that is here. There is a uh, backscatter detector available. It is a Robinson backscatter detector, which is a scintillator type. And then there's a through the lens secondary electron detector, which is located here. You can very gently push the door shut. And then once the door is shut, you can pump the system down. There is focus on your right hand, magnification on the left. Just above the focus knob are controls for scan speed. Minus scan speed is a slower scan speed, plus speed, scan speed is a faster scan speed. These control how quickly the beam is rastered across the sample. You have brightness and contrast control for whichever detector is currently being selected. You have a camera button which turns on the infrared camera and turns off the infrared camera, depending on which mode that it is in. Shift X and Shift Y are shift controls for beam shift. These are really useful above maybe 25,000 X in order to line up your samples or shift imaging areas. We do not use the resume button, but we do use the exchange button. The exchange button will come in when you're using sample change and it will run through the system to turn off the high voltage, move the stage to a safe position, switch on the infrared chamber scope, as well as venting the system, which would be turning off the pumps. We have scan rotation control. This is for controlling the raster scan. You can rotate the image electronically. This does not physically rotate the, the sample. We have a freeze button, which freezes the beam and unfreezes the beam. We have aperture X alignment and aperture Y alignment. These are utilized for doing aperture alignment when you select different apertures. And we also have a wobble control. Wobble control is essentially a control that wobbles the focus as if you were turning the focus knob back and forth for doing your um, aperture alignment. We have stigmator controls, X and Y. Um, these are utilized for correcting astigmatism in the image. These two corrections I will explain once we've gotten everything set up and running. And then the last button is the reduced button. And this button is utilized to put a small scan window on the screen where you can raster a little more quickly and then move the box around <coughs> to your area of interest. At this point, we have vacuum ready on the vacuum SEM control panel, and we can go through the process of setting up our sample. The <coughs> five axis user joystick here controls the stage. There is an XY joystick, which utilizes, is used for moving the stage in X and Y. And then the top of that tall joystick is used to turn the sample or rotate the sample holder on the center of the holder. The shorter joystick is used for height adjustment, that would be Z, and then your tilt adjustment, which is T.
once we are ready, we can bring the sample up into position for imaging. And really the easiest way to do this is to bring the sample up slowly until you get it close to where you would like it to be. And then once it's nearby, you can take the joystick and place it onto the countertop. One of the reasons that I mentioned that the y-axis is moving left to right in the chamber is that you can rotate the joystick 90 degrees in order to have the sample follow the motion that you're pushing the joystick in. Now there are a few things that we're going to be looking for. We'll use this taller sample as an example. And one of them would be a small amount of shadow. And then also rotation. If we move it to the left here, you can see that we have gone past the final lens and we might almost be imaging this sample. Or if we are interested in this one here, we would like it to be there. A few other visual cues to look for is the brightness here, as well as whether or not there is a shadow. You can see that it got dark across the front there. And then also whether or not the front edge of the sample holder is in focus. Okay, and that's right about there. So a small amount of shadow, focus, and then the height. We're actually going to start off with the sample just to the left here. So I'm actually just going to rotate that sample into position. And that's where we'll start our initial imaging. imaging. <clears throat> there are a few things to check. On the gun tab, we would come over, make sure what our starting EHG value is. Typically, 5 kilovolts is a good place to start. And this is a topic that we can discuss a little bit more in detail later on. We also would like to come in and start with the 30 micron aperture. The aperture control is found on the apertures tab of the SEM control panel. And in this case, we could pick an aperture from the list. The smaller the aperture, the lower the probe current. The larger the aperture, the more probe current. So typically for analytical work, you would select a larger aperture. And for things where you're doing <coughs> um, standard imaging, you'd pick a smaller. Today we'll start off with the 30 micron. So we're going to start off at 5 kilovolts and a 30 micron aperture. Typically, current-wise, that's probably around 250 picoamps. If your sample is very beam sensitive, you might consider using less current. There are multiple ways to do everything in the software, and I like to call these ways parallel methods. We could select EHT on from the gun tab. We could click on the red X in the status bar and say EHT on. Or we could go to the Windows pull-down menu and do EHT on in that location. We'll get a small progress bar across the bottom of the screen, which will indicate that the beam is running up. And then once it's run up, we can press the camera button on the control panel, which will switch us to the live imaging mode. At this point, the screen is refreshing a little bit. It's getting very bright. I would first come to the number one button press the one button, which will bring us back to the fastest possible scan rate. And then we can adjust our brightness and contrast. It's always good practice to come to the magnification control, go completely counterclockwise, anti-clockwise, and bring the magnification to its lowest possible setting. And then come to the focus control and focus the image roughly. Once the image is roughly focused and things look like they might be in focus, we can increase magnification until the image is out of focus, and then we can make adjustments again. 
And we just repeat this process until we get to a point where we can't make the image any better. I just press the small reduced button. That gives me a small scan window. I can adjust my brightness and contrast. I'm looking for edges that aren't too bright and areas that aren't too dark. As I adjust my focus, the first thing I'm noticing is that this square on the bottom here, which I'll move up to the center of the screen, is shifting ever so slightly. If I misalign the aperture a little bit further, you can actually see that that entire square is shifting. Typically, I would make aperture alignment my first adjustment and then follow that by astigmatism adjustment. Basically, in this microscope, when we are adjusting the aperture, we're not mechanically aligning the aperture. We're adjusting the beam to the aperture. Okay. So we're just watching for any shift or translation in the image. If you do notice that there is some stretching in this image, that stretching is actually astigmatism. We'll correct the astigmatism after we correct the aperture misalignment. We'll press the wobble button, which is automatically changing the focus for us. As you can see that the image is primarily shifting in the y-axis, so we'll adjust the y-axis. And now the image is shifting left to right, so we'll adjust the x. And basically we want this to go perfectly in and out of focus until we've got it completed. Once we get to where we think the aperture alignment is good, we can change our scan speed. I slowed the scan speed down to reduce the noise in the image. And you can see that now in the image there is stretching going in this axis. And then as we focus this way, you can see stretching going in this axis. Best focus is actually where we see no distortion in the image. At this point, we would come to the stigmator controls <coughs> and make adjustments with those. And at this point, we're just going to try to make the image as sharp as we possibly can with the stigmators. Once you've adjusted one axis, you come in and readjust focus, and then you adjust the other axis. And once the image is as sharp as you can make it, you can just recheck your aperture alignment to make sure that it is good. Fastest scan speed works well. If the little aperture window doesn't pop up, you can come straight to the apertures tab where you will have all the controls there. The amplitude control can be used to increase your amplitude depending on your magnification or decrease your amplitude. The higher the magnification, the less amplitude you should use to see the misalignment. Once the image is going perfectly in and out of focus, you can turn off the wobble. Increase your magnification until the image is out of focus again, and then you can go through the process all over again. So 
So we started off at around 76X, and we can bring the magnification all the way up to well over 200,000, almost 300,000 times. At this point, I would say, let's take a break, and you can go in and try to do all this yourself on the microscope if you're available at that time.